The last Metroid is no longer Metroid Fusion. The galaxy is at peace. I first encountered the Metroid series in Super Smash Bros. for the Nintendo 64 when I was only three years old. I don't remember when I first heard the notion that Samus is a woman, but it was a thought that stuck in my mind. I eventually got a copy of Super Metroid, which I played the crap out of. Super Metroid became my number one comfort game when I was young. Hmm. A game about a woman whose femininity isn't obvious at first glance, but blossoms in the end. I wonder why this game was important to Teenage Juliet. I enjoyed most of the Metroid series, but aside from Super, there was one other game that became very special to me. I'm Juliet Necro, and I'm a goth trans dork who makes video essays for other goth trans dorks. So walk into my mystery. Step inside and hold on for dear life. This one's gonna be good. Like I said, Metroid is incredibly important to me. It's my favorite game series, and it's no wonder that Alien is also my favorite movie series. I even made this fucking meme the exact week I realized I'm transgender. The fact that Samus stuck around in my brain so much finally made sense. My two favorite games in the series are Super and Fusion, and I want to focus on Fusion today. It's pretty self-evident why Super is great at this point, considering that there's an entire genre that are basically refractions of Super Metroid. Yes, I know that Koji Igarashi said he was inspired by Link to the Past and not Super Metroid, but the fact is, his Castlevania game still came out Super Metroid coded regardless. Super Metroid is still the queen of Metroidvanias as far as I'm concerned. Metroid skipped out on the Nintendo 64, leaving Super Metroid and Samus' appearance in Super Smash Bros. as the only flag bearers of the series in that generation. However, the GameCube era and the first half of the Wii's life cycle proved to be a golden age for fans of the series. In 2002, something unprecedented happened, and two Metroid games were released on the same day. One of these games is Metroid Prime. It got more attention than its sister game, probably by virtue of being a console game rather than being a handheld, and for kicking off one of the most acclaimed trilogies in Nintendo's history. I remember downloading the special channel to my Wii that was nothing but trailers and art set to drum up hype for Metroid Prime 3. The Prime Trilogy is fun, but I have a few minor gripes with them that I'll mention in just a minute. The other game was a bit of an anomaly. Contrary to what you might expect, this humble little Game Boy Advance game, Metroid Fusion, is the game that actually bears the title Metroid 4. The whole Prime Trilogy forms a kind of plot cul-de-sac that takes place between Metroids 1 and 2 instead. For 19 years, most of my life, Metroid Fusion was the furthest game forward in the timeline and the most experimental. I also think that it has the most interesting, resonant narrative in the series. I'm going to argue here that Metroid Fusion can be read as a queer story and demonstrate that reading here. This game has themes of trauma, of losing one's sense of self, and having that self turn against you. It's about waking up to realize you're not as safe as you thought you were. And ultimately, it's about restoring confidence in yourself and the redemptive power of love and trust. 2D Metroid has always worked a bit differently than other Nintendo franchises. Most Nintendo franchises basically function like anthologies. Usually, when a sequel to a Nintendo game comes out, you're not really interested in how the story will progress. It's mainly about delivering a new spin on the series' familiar mechanics. I earnestly believe that they made the Zelda timeline to troll people who cared about the canon. On the other hand, 2D Metroid has the most consistent and evolving narrative of any of Nintendo's brands. Metroid has a narrative that it's stuck to from the prequel manga straight through to Metroid Dread. It's also not afraid to change up the series mechanics to serve the needs of the story. Metroid 2 went much more linear because it was singularly based on Samus' quest to eradicate the Metroids. In the same vein, Metroid Fusion is much more linear than Super due to Samus' lack of autonomy within the narrative. So I don't think being mad at Metroid Fusion for not playing like Super is very useful since that difference serves a narrative function, and I play Metroid games just as much if not more for the story than for the gameplay, because I'm cool like that. That's right, I play a Nintendo franchise for the storyline. One of the reasons that I enjoy Metroid Fusion so deeply is simply for the fact that it's the game we hear the most from Samus in. One of my pet peeves is people calling Samus a silent protagonist. She is self-evidently not silent. The most important game to the series' identity literally starts with her first-person narration. 
I think people get that impression from the Prime series, where she really is silent. Don't get me wrong, I like the Prime games. They're fun, but they're also a bit frustrating to me because they tell us nothing about Samus as a character. She's pretty much the exact same person at the beginning of the trilogy as at the end. This is in contrast to 2D Metroid. I also like Metroid Dread. I'm glad Metroid is back, but again, I feel like Samus should especially have more to say about this game's events as well. She gets a few lines of dialogue in Chozo, and then she screams a lot at the end, and that's it. I suspect that there are two reasons for this, and they're the popularity of the Prime Trilogy relative to 2D Metroid, and the curse of Metroid Other M. Metroid Other M's most grievous injustice was being a horribly sexist piece of filth and a character assassination of both Samus and Adam, and even then it's completely incompetent in telling that story. The fact that that game was so coolly received probably soured the developers on the idea of having another game like Fusion. I don't think we'll see another game like this for a long, long time. Right off the bat, Fusion establishes its identity as the most foreboding game in the series. Like most Metroid games, it starts with a few slides that set up where we begin, but unlike Super, which introduced the triumphant Metroid intro theme that opened the video, this game's introduction is set to the much more downbeat Sector 1 theme. Dread brought back the Super recap theme, which makes sense since Samus is less vulnerable in that story. Here, it's an immediate signal that things won't be so cushy for our heroine this time. Samus has been assigned to help a biological research firm explore SR-388, the former homeworld of the Metroid species, and document its wildlife. While there, she gets infected with an unknown amoeba-like parasite. It quickly multiplies and attacks her central nervous system, causing her to go into a coma. Both Samus and her power suit have to be radically surgically altered to save her life, and her doctors resort to using an experimental vaccine created from the cells of the infant Metroid Samus rescued on her first trip to SR-388. Pondering this fact, I realize I owe the Metroid hatchling my life twice over. Samus wakes up to a new reality. She is much more vulnerable than she was before. In Super Metroid, the very basic enemies you encounter at the beginning of the game hit you for 5 damage out of your total of 99 starting energy while Metroid Fusion has basic enemies do 15 damage to the same energy pool. The enemies in this game are much more aggressive, hard to hit, and damaging. I can pretty casually no death run super, but I still get tripped up at least once every time I play Fusion, and I've beaten it maybe 12 to 15 times. One of the more uncomfortable parts of awakening to one's queerness is that it does in some way make your life harder. Bear in mind that prior to coming out as a trans woman, I was living as a straight white dude in the global north, so being trans has been my first taste of having a marginalized identity. I recognize this as an immense privilege. If your identity intersects multiple different marginalized groups, then it might not have been as shocking to you. For me, however, realizing I'm transgender brought a lot of joy, but also a fair bit of anxiety over what my new reality would be like. The fact is, life is just harder for queer people because of continued bias against us even in places where we enjoy more rights. Even in those places, some would like to treat those rights as up for debate. However, there are some other changes that Samus can take advantage of after her metamorphosis. She can now climb certain walls and ceilings and mantle up ledges, where no such option existed with her older, much heavier suit. When you start living as a queer person, the rules you live by change, but over time you can adapt and learn to appreciate the changes for what they are. Samus does the same. And then Zero Mission shit all over the thematic meaning of this new ability by introducing the Power Grip upgrade. Seriously, could you not have like brought back the Grapple Beam or something instead? Frustrating, especially since wall hanging is just part of Samus's moveset now as if Samus returns. However, ledge grabbing was new in Fusion. Zero Mission is a good game, but it's kind of disjointed with its follow-ups thematically, so we're going to say that it goes Metroid 1 to Return of Samus to Super, so I don't look like a fool for saying that wall hanging is new. In this case, Samus finds herself still alive, but changed, and more vulnerable than before, just like us. As for me, one life ended, yet I survived. Reborn is something different. This fucking line in the intro to this game has been occupying a huge amount of space in my brain ever since I came out to myself. If the pure, raw, transsexual energy rating off this line isn't enough to convince you that Samus is a trans woman, just remember that she's six foot three, has a husky voice, and works in a male-dominated field. If that's not a sign, I don't know what is. 
There's also just something kind of trans femme coded about the design of Samus's suit. It's the broad shoulders combined with the feminine waist, maybe. I don't know. It's a vibe. The suit just has the vibes, okay? If you disagree with me on this, I hope you piss your pants at work tomorrow. Also, I don't care that that line isn't the same in Japanese. I didn't play the game in Japanese. The author's been dead since before I, and probably you, were born. I used sinister demonic magics to send messages back in time and tell Roland Barthes to kill the author back in 1967. It was me all along. After being revived, Samus is asked to investigate a biological research station where samples from SR-388 were kept. An explosion occurred there, and the crew isn't responding to attempts at contact. For some reason, this awoke a nameless fear in my heart, and now I am being sent there to investigate. My mission on the BSL station will be overseen by my new ship's computer. Following the commands of this blunt, computerized CO is something I have to bear, as it was a condition of my taking the ship. For someone who dislikes taking orders, this is the second time I've found myself having to do so. It makes me recall my other commanding officer. This job is quite a bit different from her previous adventure. In addition to her greater vulnerability and the murkiness of the threat, Samus isn't alone this time. Previously, the Galactic Federation trusted her to accomplish her mission on Zevus in Metroid 1 and SR-388 in Metroid 2 without assistance. In Super Metroid, Samus wasn't even on a Federation assignment. She just kind of went and did that. But now, Samus has a shipboard computer that acts as a liaison to the Federation and gives her orders. The computer is pretty brusque with Samus at first. I am already detecting massive bio signs in this region. The X are gathering. This may be our chance to exterminate them, but... You are only at 10% battle capacity. Your chance of survival is extremely low. The Federation needs you alive and on duty, Samus. Trapped aboard a desolate space station full of murderous shape-shifting amoeba with a shipboard computer you're not sure if you can trust. Typical Tuesday night, am I right, ladies? Because the no-nonsense attitude of the computer reminds Samus of her old superior officer, she likes to name it Adam in his honor. For most of the game, Computer Adam is very short with Samus, and there's even one pivotal scene partway through the game. Does Samus suspect anything? No, I do not think so. Good. Monitor her closely. Affirmative. Out. Not knowing who you can trust is another unfortunate part of being a queer person. Part of the reason it's so much easier to hang out with other queer people is that you don't have to be worried about them being queer-phobic in some way, unless they're one of those cringe-ass LGB without the T losers. Being queer is not always visible. We don't have rainbow skin or a uniform, so we can often fly under the radars of cishet people. It can often be a terrifying experience to identify yourself as a queer person to someone who stands on such things you're not sure about. I've known that I'm transgender for almost two years now, and my coworkers, clients, and employers still have no idea because I am still so terrified of how they might react. As someone who had some trust issues even before coming out, it's been extra difficult. The Wachowski sisters said it best with the line, anyone who hasn't been unplugged, i.e. isn't trans or queer, has the potential to be an agent. Samus is forced to rely on people for survival that she can't trust. About half of the upgrades that you get in the game are software updates uploaded by the Federation. In the modern day, we all rely on institutions to live to some extent or another. No woman is an island, but for queer people, this is often more difficult, since we're unsure if we can trust these institutions to understand us or sympathize with us. Over time, Samus starts to regain her independence as she regains her power, because the other half of her ability she gets by absorbing Core X bosses. These bosses came from the X parasites that infected Samus's suit, so they restore Samus's lost abilities once they're absorbed. As a result of being infused with Metroid DNA, Samus is now immune to X-Infection, and can in fact absorb them. Instead of having health and ammo pickups, this game has health and ammo amoebas. It's not surprising to me that the Metroid game with the most queer themes is also the one that first played up the monstrous aspects of Samus as a character. Samus was already not quite human, having been enhanced with Chozo DNA in order to live on Zebus with her two gay bird dads. But this is not often mentioned in the games themselves, until Dread brought it back to the forefront in a big way. However, Samus is also now part Metroid, and Metroids are hated and feared in the universe, to the point that Samus herself was ordered to make the species extinct in Metroid 2. She now has that bit of monsterization in her as well. Queer people identifying with monsters is nothing new. We feel a certain kinship with monsters because they're so feared and hated by the mainstream. This is especially true of monsters who are the protagonists of their story and get sympathetic portrayals. 
It's why Frankenstein is one of my favorite books. Samus is now one of these sympathetic monsters. She's my favorite monster if she counts. However, being part Metroid isn't all upsides. Samus has also inherited the Metroid species' weakness to cold, meaning that she is just as unable to enter icy rooms as hot rooms without the Varia suit equipped. It also makes her weak to enemies that attack with ice-based weapons, of which one is by far the most notable. The first time Samus takes the main elevator down towards the six sectors, the camera breaks away from her. Notably, this is the first time in the first four Metroid games that the camera stops following Samus. Something blows through the wall. This is the SAX, an ex-parasite mimicking Samus at the height of her powers. I genuinely believe that the SAX is the greatest villain that Nintendo has ever produced. The SAX is hunting Samus aboard the station, trying to stymie her attempts to keep the ex-parasites from spreading and propagating. Naturally, since it mimics Samus with all of her abilities, it has access to the Ice Beam, which devastates Samus now that she has a weakness to the cold. The Ice Beam is one of the strongest abilities in almost all of the 2D Metroid games. In Super especially, it makes regular enemies practically not a threat at all anymore once you obtain it. In Fusion, Samus can't use it anymore since she's weak to the cold now, but the SAX can. It's a great bit of player disempowerment to make you feel weak by comparison. I want to return to what I said earlier about the camera movement in the scene where the SAX first appeared. Like I said, it's the first time in the first four Metroid games that the camera breaks away from Samus. She is literally no longer the subject and instead is the object. This is something that one has to get used to upon transitioning and beginning to live as a woman. Sadly, society is still frequently geared towards viewing men as subjects who do things, and women as objects to whom things happen. Despite being a woman, Samus has historically been the subject, of course, but she has literally gone from being a hunter to prey. In her book Sexed Up, the sociologist Julia Serrano points out that societal scripts continue to think of men as predators and women as prey, subjects and objects. Serrano is a trans woman, so she has experience being on both sides of this script. If you've been perceived as a man before, you've probably had an experience where you tried not to be perceived as a threat. And if you've been perceived as a woman, you've probably felt threatened in a situation before. No one ever followed me for multiple city blocks trying to get me to come home with them when I was a boy, but it's definitely happened to me since starting to transition. In that moment, I felt dehumanized. I was a means to an end. I certainly felt like prey in that moment. Luckily, I managed to shake him but it still keeps me up sometimes. I relate a lot to experiencing a newfound fear of being hunted, of being treated like prey, an object, a means to an end, much like Samus has here. The SAX, an enemy with my strongest abilities. But does it have a reason? Probably not. It's just a killing machine. In my current state, I can't face it head on. The SAX is me, only heartless. I must stop it before it learns its potential and threatens the universe. There's also a bit of gender dynamics going on with the idea of the SAX becoming the hunter. I joked earlier that Samus works in a male-dominated field, but you'd be hard-pressed to find an activity more associated with traditional masculinity than hunting. It's why you've got manosphere types eating animal organs claiming that we need to get back to nature or whatever. Naturally, research suggests that Stone Age people were more complicated than men hunt, women gather. But I digress. The point is, in this game, Samus spends her time gathering her strength while simultaneously being hunted by the SAX. She's the most vulnerable she's ever been here, more of an object than before, and part of life as a trans woman is coming to grips with vulnerability that wasn't there before. Again, I'm only speaking from my own experience here, your mileage may vary. There's also something to the fact that the SAX looks like Samus. Another near-universal part of the trans experience is being shocked by your own appearance, at least until you start to become comfortable in yourself. The first time I looked in the mirror after figuring out what my gender was, I almost threw up. The idea of being stalked by something that looks like your old self and embodies the qualities that made your old self scary and off-putting is a particularly queer-coded kind of nightmare. Celeste did the same thing many years later, and that game's trans as hell. I'm trying to turn Metroid into a queer series here, my secret goal with every video I produce is to turn the game I'm talking about into a game that people associate with trans women, so that people will bring up games besides New Vegas around us. As I've gained more confidence, a lot of my dysphoria has evaporated, 
and my trans experience has been characterized much more by euphoria. I hope that the same thing will happen to you. Really, I think the ex-parasites in general are Nintendo's best villain ever, and they really make a perfect villain for a story with as many queer vibes as this one does. There's a pivotal scene about halfway through the game where the ex-parasites attempt to overload the main boiler and cause an explosion aboard the station. Upon arriving at the boiler, Samus sees an unsettling sight, an ex-parasite mimicking a member of the station's crew and interfacing with the station's systems. This proves something that Samus and the computer Adam were afraid of. The ex mimicked a crew member. It all makes sense now. The ex can absorb the memories and knowledge of their prey. What an astounding find. HQ was very impressed. The X proved to be intelligent in their pursuit of propagation and spreading. They are intelligence and power without compassion. In contrast to this, immediately after this scene, Samus gets a new objective from the computer Adam. Samus, I see bioscience on the habitation deck. Survivors? The infected crewman you saw had survived until recently. Maybe there's a chance. In contrast to the cold, monstrous inhumanity of the X parasites, Samus immediately moves to do something out of compassion. When Samus arrives on the habitation deck, she discovers that the survivors are not humans, but instead Etacoons and Tachoras, the very same animals she rescued on planet Zevis back in Super Metroid. You did save the animals, didn't you? Not only does this humanize Samus in contrast to the SAX and the X parasites, it's also a reminder of past compassion, since these are the very same animals. It's also these animals who taught Samus how to wall jump and shine spark back in the last game. It's quite a bit like how in our own lives, what allows us to survive, even in dangerous times for us like these, is compassion for each other, and the capacity to learn survival skills from each other. Almost every queer person can cite one person who is like a mentor or older sibling to them, helping them learn the skills they need to make it out there. The animals wind up staying aboard Samus' ship and avoid being infected by X. Put a pin in this for later. The distrust I mentioned earlier between Samus and Computer Adam starts to come to a head. When a huge ex-parasite creature stops up the station's power silo, Samus goes off to kill it, and in the process restores her plasma beam functionality. In addition, on the way to killing the creature, Samus is required to be seen and chased by the SAX and come out of the encounter alive. Adam's reaction to this is odd. What? You've restored plasma beam functionality? Most unexpected. Even so, continue to avoid the SAX. It too may be stronger. And you still lack a few abilities crucial to survival. Even though Samus has already gotten a lot stronger and has encountered and escaped the SAX at least once by now, Adam continues to advise her not to challenge it, almost like the computer is protecting the monster rather than Samus. Next, Samus restores function to her gravity suit and winds up exploring a lot of the aquarium section of Sector 4 on her own. What follows is one of my favorite parts of this game. Samus is finally a little bit outside Computer Adam's grip, with a moment of reprieve. The best track on the game's soundtrack, and possibly my favorite in the whole series, comes on. You can almost feel in your bones the relief that Samus is feeling, being isolated from the ship's computer for the time being. It's quiet and meditative and relaxing compared to the frenetic, ordered structure of most of the game. It starts to feel more like Super Metroid again. Now that Samus has learned the rules of her new reality, and put a lot of facets of herself back together, she feels more like her old self, but changed by what she's gone through. She's wiser, more experienced, ready for the remaining challenges. As queer people, we're often much more scrutinized than other people, followed more closely and hounded. Therefore, moments of reprieve from that scrutiny are all the sweeter. They give us time to reflect on how far we've come. That's what I read this aquarium section as. Samus's moment of looking back and seeing how far she's already come in her transition to her new reality. She has changed, yes, but she's recovered a lot of what she lost in the change. She's regaining her strength and her confidence. When I first started transitioning, I was flailing about, looking for validation externally, but as I've aged into my transition, I have outgrown the need for external validation. And I'm in a position now when I'm starting to help others earlier on than me. I've had my own Sector 4 aquarium moment. How fitting that this section ends with Samus getting another upgrade that Computer Adam wasn't expecting. This time it's the new diffusion missile upgrade that sort of combines the effects of power bombs and the ice beam. Once again, the ship's computer is taken aback by this. You upgraded your missiles? That's unusual. There was no word from HQ. A procedural error, I'm sure. Even so, I did not approve of bypassing security level 4. From now on, you will use more discretion. The computer can tell that Samus is getting ready to buck its authority and tries to put its foot down. And the moment when she really will buck that authority comes now. 
Samus goes to confront a rogue security robot she encountered once before, and in the process discovers a strange, sectioned-off area of the station. After killing the robot and regaining the wave beam, she lets Curiosity guide her back there, despite the computer's insistence that she leave the area immediately after dealing with the robot. Samus is now finally ready to step back into a modified version of her old role. She does the same thing she did in all of Metroid 1 and Super Metroid, using a new ability to gain access to a previously inaccessible area. It's a remarkable bit of re-empowerment, despite the lasting changes. Inside, she finds that she was right not to trust the Federation or Computer Atom. In the restricted area, the Federation is running a cloning operation where they are making more Metroids. This is the same Federation that sicked Samus on the Space Pirates back in Metroid 1 because they were using Metroids as bioweapons. Then they had her exterminate the whole species in Return of Samus. It's clear now that they didn't actually care about the danger the Metroids posed, just that they wanted a monopoly on them. Luckily, Samus and the SAX's goals align. The X-Parasite tries to use all of Samus's abilities to destroy the Metroids, instinctively lashing out at the X's natural predators. Samus takes advantage of the chaos to escape, and the restricted area is jettisoned from the station and self-destructs. Adam is obviously a bit upset about this. Samus, you shouldn't have done that. You ignored your orders. You may have to pay a price for that quite soon. As you can see, the Federation has been secretly working on a Metroid breeding program. For peaceful applications only, of course. Please understand. But perhaps you already knew of this program's existence. Certainly, you must have had doubts when you saw Sector 1. SRX, a faithful replica of the SR388 ecosystem. Ideal for raising Alpha, Gamma, Zeta, and even Omega Metroids. This research even uncovered techniques for rapid growth. Imagine, creating an Omega from a larval Metroid in days. But that research is finished. One of the SAX is on its way here. Samus actually speaks up in reply to this. This is the first time in the whole game that she bothers to reply to anything the computer says, likely because she feels she's regained enough of her confidence to do so and already defied her orders once. One? Are you saying there is more than one SAX? Samus is ordered back to her ship and sulks about the computer. The real Adam would have said the same thing about that incident, but he would have softened the blow. He was relentless in his criticism, but he always cared. He was not a machine obsessed with duty. No such compassion could exist in that computer. Samus recognizes that what separates us from monsters is our capacity for compassion and love. Now that she's regained nearly all of her abilities, it's pretty much all that separates her from the SIX. Fundamentally, what makes someone queer is who they love or what makes them happy. This is why forces incapable or unwilling to understand the concept of love make such great villains for queer stories. To dust off the same comparison I made earlier in the video, it's why the Wachowski sisters chose to make the villains in their stories machines, and it's why Agent Smith calls love insipid and human in The Matrix Revolutions. Or how about this one? In her excellent and very long video on Knights of the Old Republic 2, the video essayist Salmatol argued that that game has a queer narrative. One of the primary villains of KOTOR 2 is Darth Nihilus, who is similarly a wound, a void where compassion and empathy are supposed to go in a human being. In its place is a desire to consume. The X-Parasites are much the same way. Samus describes them this way. The X hunger for form, knowledge, and power. They mimic these perfectly, but they cannot copy the soul. They're single-minded, instinctively seeking to increase in number. They're a plague, and the Federation underestimates their threat. When I realized I'm trans, it was the first time I felt human. Before that, I felt like I was a wound, a void where a human was supposed to be. That emptiness is personified in monsters like the X-Parasites or the Machines. I now feel much more deeply than I did before, for better and worse. Being queer made me a human being. On her way out of the station, Samus encounters an odd-looking area. It resembles Turian, the computerized heart of planet Zebes, where Samus confronted Mother Brain twice. Samus was raised on Zebes, and Mother Brain was originally a Chozo computer that betrayed them in favor of the space pirates. Doubtless, she's uncomfortable seeing imagery like this again. To make matters worse, in the depths of this area is an ex-parasite mimicking Ridley, who died his very definitely final death back in Super Metroid. Hopefully. Hopefully they don't also fuck up the thematic weight of that by bringing him back in Metroid 6, but considering their track record in Samus Returns, they probably will. Ridley is also a major source of trauma for Samus, considering that he murdered her birth parents in front of her when she was just three years old. At first, I thought it was a little cheap to have Ridley show up again in this game, but now I kind of get it a little more. The sad fact is, coming out as queer will not magically solve all of your trauma. 
However, it does help us confront it. Now that I don't have the malaise of being in the wrong gender hanging over my head, I've been a lot more successful in unpacking things that happened to me when I was younger that still linger. Obviously, I'm not confronting those things with super missiles and charge beams like Samus is, but the metaphor remains. Hell, maybe I should be confronting those things with super missiles and charge beams. Who's to say? After escaping the Turian-like area, Samus uplinks to Computer Adam once more. He delivers a shocking message. Turns out, the computer is going full science officer Ash mode. If you'll permit me, I'll read the full exchange. Samus, we're done here. Leave the rest to the Federation. We should be preparing to evacuate the station. Are you joking? Do they know how dangerous the X are? How quickly they reproduce? The Federation has taken an interest in the X and the SAX. They believe this life form has endless potential applications. This is ridiculous! The X are heartless abominations! What potential could they have? It is not necessary for you to understand such matters. The Federation is coming now. You should just leave quietly. This is madness! They won't stand a chance here! This station will devour them! What could be worth the risk? Capturing the SAX, of course. Are you serious? Do you really think they can succeed? It will certainly be difficult. They don't expect your help. They knew you would try to destroy the SAX. That's why they stopped sending you support data. The plasma beam modification was ready some time ago, but they withheld it to keep you from engaging the SAX. Yet somehow you restored that function on your own. They also tried to withhold the diffusion missile upgrade because they didn't want you to grow too powerful. But they had already sent it, and you tracked it down. Bravo, Samus. They must cancel this mission! Open a channel to HQ! I won't let this happen! They're already on their way. Fools. Here is where all of that distrust of the Federation comes out. They also think they can use the X-Parasites as weapons, like they were almost certainly planning to do with the Metroids. It also shows that Samus is still being marginalized, despite having regained a lot of her strength. The Federation's respect for her is conditional on her compliance with their ends. Believe me, I've been a campaign issue for long enough, called demonic by conservatives and an election liability by liberals, to know that my rights are very much viewed as conditional by some people. With mainstream politicians like these, is it any wonder that so many queers are also socialists? Samus has slammed up against the barrier that comes from being marginalized and working within the system. Also, hi, this is me recording a few days later in the editing bay. And there's also something to be said for the fact that the Federation is more invested in the, like, pre-transition, um, like, old idea of Samus. Just like, you know, a lot of people in our real lives are more invested in our pre-transition selves that they are blind to how we are now. Samus resolves that she needs to destroy the station in order to prevent the Federation from trying to capture the X. In the process, she's reduced to begging the computer for help, since it's locked her in the navigation room. That's when something incredible happens. Open the hatch! I've been ordered to confine you until the ships arrive. Don't let them do this! Can't you see what will happen, Adam? Adam? Who is Adam? A, a friend of mine? And what would this friend advise you to do now? He would know that the only way to end this is to start the self-destruct cycle. He'd know how important it is. Did this Adam care for you? He would understand that some must live and some must die. He, he knew what it meant. He made that sacrifice once. So he chose life for you, our fair warrior, Samus Aran. Your Adam gave his life so that you might keep yours, for the sake of the universe. How foolish. How dare you? How could you hope to understand, machine? You know that detonating this station in high orbit would not guarantee the complete extinction of the X-Parasites, even though the station would be utterly destroyed. You would only succeed in removing the one obstacle to the galaxy's ruin, yourself. You would ignore this simple fact and choose death. When Adam decided who would live, he chose incorrectly. If you were to alter the station's orbit, then you might be able to include the planet in the vaporization field of the self-destruct detonation. You would have to start the propulsion sequence now, before the Federation arrives. Samus, this is your final mission. Go to the operations room and adjust the station's orbit path to intercept SR-388. Then return to your ship and escape. Move quickly and stay alive. That's an order. Any objections, lady? Samus has made a remarkable discovery. The computer Adam actually is the real Adam Malkovich. The Federation uploaded his mind to the computer, hoping to continue to use his military know-how. However, now his personality and his moral compass are also asserting themselves. Joke's on you, you thought this game was just about one queer awakening, but it's actually about two. I think it's quite significant that what causes Adam's personality to reawaken is Samus using his name. Names are obviously important to trans people, since we choose our names. 
although in some way I wouldn't say that I chose the name Juliet per se. I had a list of names I wanted to try. Amanda, Catherine, Claire, Cornelia, Felicity, Jill, Joni, Josephine, Julia, Juliet, Sophia, and Stella. However, the first time my friend Chris called me Juliet, as a way to test out the name, I had to mute my mic because I started crying a little bit immediately. That one moment was so powerful. I felt like I was finally human, just like Adam had his humanity restored. It's same as showing some compassion, referring to him by name and appealing to his heart and intuition rather than his mind, that allows him to finally assert himself. When one awakens to their queerness, it often happens from the heart before it goes to the mind, too. So much of our culture conditions us to not be this way, that our heads try to push back on us. If you're early on, listen to what your heart tells you, not the voice in your head. Eventually, your brain will get the memo, too. We're in the end game now. In the process of setting the station to self-destruct, Samus finally confronts the SAX. It turns out to be a much easier fight than Samus was initially expecting. She's grown stronger than the demon inside herself. She's actualized now, acclimated to her new life, despite its disadvantages. It's a powerful moment in transition to face yourself and say, I like this better. I'm more powerful than I've ever been. If you're still early in your transition and haven't gotten there yet, consider this my exhortation. Don't give up, you will get there. In the end, Samus goes to escape, but instead of her ship, she finds an Omega Metroid, the one survivor of the restricted area. Samus finds herself unable to stand up to it, and neither is the SAX. The monster mimicking Samus gets reduced to its core X form, and Samus absorbs it, restoring her suit's original color scheme and the ability to use the ice beam. With it, she kills the Omega Metroid and escapes. This is that reconciliation I talked about. Now that she's regained a lot of her confidence, she's able to reincorporate the parts of her personality that made her uncomfortable before, without compromising on what she has learned. In my own life, I've become a lot more confident in who I am, a lot more able to do the things that I've always wanted to do, finally become happy thanks to having reconciled with who I am. Samus recovers from the anxiety and trauma of awakening to a new reality, ready to live. Different, but as powerful as before. I feel more powerful than I ever have before. The very last note of the game is one more reminder. The Etacoons and Dechoras sleep safely aboard Samus's gunship. They were the ones who flew the ship out of the docking bay to protect it from the Metroid. Samus's kindness pays off in the end. It's what allows her to survive, recover, and go on to thrive, just like Samus's empathy caused Adam to awaken. In the very end, Samus delivers one more line I would like to touch on. We are all bound by our experiences. They are the limits of our consciousness. But in the end, the human soul will ever reach for the truth. I, for one, live by the motto of seeking the truth in all things. We are all bound by our experiences, and part of why I've begun making my videos is to share those experiences. Obviously, I only live inside my own head, but asserting that I am here, and my thoughts are worth sharing, is important to me. Being who I am, having gone through fear and trauma and emerging again, stronger and recovering, is a part of seeking the truth. I hope that by riding along with me on this journey, you've come a little bit closer to finding your own truth as well. That's all for today. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a subscribe and share it around. I'd really appreciate it. I really, really enjoy sharing my work with others, and I would like to as many people as possible to see it. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Ciao.